Um, if you are brand new to class, welcome in today. Um, if you are brand new, you are going to be following me in a level one version of the things that we do. So the first part of the class is Ross doing some reconditioning stuff to work on just a little bit of strength. Um, and then I will do the yoga section, which would be mostly around relaxation and isn't really leveled at all. Although there's a couple of bits that I always say, if this feels too much, just don't do it. Um, so everyone else, if you've been coming for around three or four weeks and you've tested and tested and tested the classes on your body, you can move up to level two. And that simply means you do a little bit more. You can also add in light tins of beans or tomatoes or whatever you've got in the store cupboard to add a bit of tiny bit of resistance in. Level three, you don't need to hear me say any of this because you know you've already transitioned up through level two, you know what you're doing. So the classes work beautifully with all the different levels going on, we just give you options, okay? And what I will say is there is also a level zero option where you just watch us, okay? So just being here, being part of the gang, hanging out, that's a really important part of just having something in your day. So if that is you today and you're thinking, I am so just in need of lying down, but I didn't want to miss out, just lie down, okay? There's always three or four people that just, I see in this position from their beds. <laughs> and that's where they stay, it's fine with me. So what happens is you get to watch me doing the movements and Ross talks through and has a little scan through. He basically keeps an eye on you all. So he's right next to the camera, okay? Um, and you get to watch me. So mostly you'll be watching me in a resting pose because level one doesn't do very much. So make sure you watch early on and then do as many reps as you feel is right for you, okay? What do we need? I think I could probably hear the collective group cry. <laughs> we need a cushion. <laughs> Definitely need a cushion. Yep, whatever level. It's always good to have a cushion nearby. Um, so if you are level two or level three, as Susie said, tins or light hand weights. Also a resistance band, again, for level two, level three. Level one, we're going to just be using mostly our body weight for the exercises and cushion for support. If you've got a belt for the yoga element, you might want that close to hand for straight after the PT part. Um, and make sure you've got some water or something to keep you hydrated. Um, if you're not sure what a resistance band looks like, these are the ones that we recommend you to get when you're ready to go up to level two. So rather than those ones that are like, um, you know, when you go to hospital and you give blood and they use a tourniquet and it's a piece of plastic and it type, don't use the ones that are like a tourniquet. Just pure rubber. They're horrible. So these ones you just get on, on Amazon, they're fabric, but they're stretchy and they're pretty tough, but they'll stick on your kind of trousers in a way that's useful. And they're not gonna cut off your blood supply. If you're not sure of what I'm holding up here or you haven't got your reading glasses on, just email me, okay? And I can point you in the right direction. They're about seven quid. Amelia, I saw you give a thumbs up on that one. Get in your glass. What is that? She's cold. Okay. So I'm not going to demonstrate with the resistance band because the level two is no already. If you've been coming to the class for two or three weeks, you start to see this familiarity in what we do, right? Spotlight. I'm sorry, Susie. Spotlight. Great. Okay. So I'm going to come down to lying on my back. And get comfy. You can put a really small pillow, cushion, folded blanket under your head, but nothing too big that's going to close in your throat, okay? I know not everyone likes lying flat. Okay, guys, we're going to start with bridge. Surprise, surprise. So if you are new to class, and as Susie says, there's always an option here of just watching along today if you want. If you're level one, we're probably going to do maybe two of these reps. You're going to do a maximum of four level two, maximum of eight, level three, maximum of 10. So we're putting our hands down by our sides, we're pushing the hips up nice and slowly, trying to breathe out as we do so, so we can engage those core muscles slowly back down to them. Great. So as I said, level one, you may just want to do a couple of these today. Great, everyone. Remember, if you are level two or three, you've got the option here of a little toe tap out to the side if you want. I'll demonstrate that just, just in case you're yeah. newer to level two and you're thinking, what is that? It's, it's actually quite hard. <laughs> yeah. 
you do a tap of the foot to the side, but please level one as if you're new, please don't try that because it genuinely is too hard. Good, like Susie's doing, if you are done with your reps, you can just straighten out those legs and just come into a resting position. <laughs> Great. So level two, level three, you might still be working, that's fine. Let's just do maybe a last couple of reps now. The next one we are going to do is going to be for upper body and it is going to be for chest, for shoulders, for biceps, triceps. Level one, we're just going to make a fist with our hands and we are going to just use the weight of our arms as a resistance. Level two, level three, remember you can use hand weights here or tins. We want to have a bend in the leg, so we've got a nice supported back and we're coming wide with those arms as Susie's doing. And she's turning her hands and she's coming straight down to the chest and pressing up. It's just those two movements. If you're level one, you're probably finished now and in rest position. It's actually a really challenging exercise. And I know that uh, in some ways it looks like it shouldn't be, but you're using not very big muscles in the arms to carry the weight of the whole arm, which is quite heavy. So don't be surprised if it makes your arm shake. And if it does, don't do too many, okay? Great, everyone. So lots of people I see still see working. We're gonna go for just last two reps, whatever level we are. Like these, the last two. Great. Okay. So we're going to give those arms a well-deserved rest and we're going to go back to lower body. The next one we are going to do is a leg lift. If you're level one, a really good idea to put a cushion under your knees here, just for support. Okay, so we're going to alternate the legs as we do this. We're just lifting the heel up off the floor and we're just going to do a point of the toe, a little flex of the foot. Do that two times and then just rest that heel back down again. You can be up on your elbows if you're level two or three. Level one, really recommend to keep the head down and just supported by a cushion. Make sure you're comfortable. We're just alternating the legs each time. So these quadriceps, they're really big muscles. They, if you're level one, you could probably do a couple either side and it's much less taxing on the body energetically than doing something with the arms which is why you might notice that doing things like hanging out the washing is more tiring than sometimes than walking upstairs. It's just these, these muscles are bigger, right? Great. How's everyone doing? Great, lots of people are just resting now. A couple still working away. And some good pointing flexing, nice array of socks as always. And never disappoint me guys with your wonderful array of sock choices. Uh, we are going to go with arms for our next one. Yes, Dave, I'm talking about you. We're going to stop with those legs there. <laughs> We're going to go with upper body. So we are going to go with a figure eight uh, pattern. So if you're comfortable with that cushion under your legs, you can still keep it there if you want, number one, or take it away. And we're going to keep those legs bent. And we've got our arms up in front of us, as Susie's showing us. Just nice and slow, this one. We don't want it to be fast. If you're level one, you're not going to be using weights here at all. Level two, level three it is an option, but don't feel like you have to. You can, if you're level two, level three, bring the knee up as you do that kind of drop down with the hand. Yep, that will engage the core a bit more as well. So we are working kind of more, mostly upper abdominals here, but we're working the whole of the chest. You may feel it most in your shoulders though. That's what's really working hard here. I feel it in my arms, but I also feel it in my stomach muscles, definitely. Yeah, sure. But it's quite nice. It's a sort of, <laughs> it's quite hypnotic. Yeah. 
my body doesn't mind doing this. I'm going to stop because I'm demonstrating level one, but <laughs> I was quite enjoying that. <laughs> Great, Joe. Nice. Okay, let's make this the last couple of seconds for this one, guys. Whatever level you are at, I want to make sure we are getting enough time to rest as well. Okay. So, Susie, you weren't feeling great on uh, Tuesday, so I did take out that uh, little, uh, your favorite one, <laughs> but we're going to have to do it today. Okay. So, if you are level two or level three, remember you can use a resistance band here if you want to. Again, it is always optional. It does make it quite a lot harder. Level one, we're not going to worry about that. We are just going to come onto our sides. Just take your time, get there in your own time. And we're going to be hinging at the hip and the heel. We want to keep the heels together, just lifting that knee up and slowly back down again. If you're level two, level three, the resistance band, remember, goes above the knee so that you're stretching that band apart as you lift the legs. It will make it about a hundred times harder. Really? <laughs> you might just want to do two or three. I've done three and that's enough for me. That is enough. Let's just have a rest there. Great. So if you're level one, if it's comfortable to rest on your side, Great, just do that, or you can come back onto your back if you want, whatever is comfortable for you. We're going to go to the other side in just a moment. Okay, so last couple of reps if you're level two, level three. And we're going to just come to the other side next. So however you want to get there is fine. Just if you want to roll over, that's probably the easiest way. Okay. All right, let's do the other side. It's exactly the same thing. Just lifting that knee nice and slow. As we always say, you may feel one side is a lot stiffer, a lot harder than the other. That's completely natural and is very, very common. Just a little tip on technique with this exercise to make it easier. And the body's really smart at making exercises easier. Uh, you might notice that you rock back can you try and stay sort of with the hips stacked so it is just a movement of the leg rather than a tipping back of the pelvis okay the body will really sneakily kind of squeeze you in there <laughs> so just notice that especially if you're doing the level two level three option of adding in that straight leg lift keep the hips stacked rather than rocking back Great. Okay, last couple. Okay, so the next one we're going to do is layer four exercises in one. It's going to be all for the arms. Lots of you know it and are already getting into position. If you're unfamiliar with it, we want to be raising ourselves up. So if you've got a cushion or a couple of cushions just to sit on, So as Susie's showing us, we want to be sitting on something that's raising us up so we can use our arms freely. Now, level one, we're not going to worry about any weights here. We're just going to make a fist and use, again, the weight of our own arms is the resistance. Level two, level three, remember, you can use some small weights here. We're going out in front to begin with, with straight arms, and we come down to that starting position, and we pull up under the armpits and back to that starting position. Straight arms and out back behind us, working those triceps. Then we're pulling up again, turning those hands and pressing up over the head, nice and slow. Great. Really good. So that is kind of four in one there. You might have felt like that's enough for you and that's fine. Just come back down into child's pose. If you're going again, it's the same sequence. We've got straight arms and we're going out in front. Pulling those hands up under the armpits. 
<laughs> my uh, my Fitbit just said, "Come on, get up and do something." <laughs> <laughs> Ignore that Fitbit. I know, um, right? <laughs> Does not understand pacing. <laughs> so I'm going to rest down in child's pose. Right. So if you're finished with your reps, then as Susie's doing, she's just resting in child's pose. Rest in whatever position is right for you, what feels comfortable. Excellent. If you're still working, let's make this the last round of these ones. Great, everyone. Brilliant. OK, I'm going to give those arms a rest. Why don't we do uh, one for the back next, Susie? Okay. Which one? So we're going to lie face down. I'm going to take that pigeon out of the way. The locust. Yeah. Can we do leg swim? Yeah, sure. I quite like that. <laughs> I think That's it would make well. my clam shell better. <laughs> it's been a while. Of course we can. Okay. <laughs> okay. I'll talk through this one because it's a bit easier. Okay. We did do this one on Tuesday, so it shouldn't be too uh, out of your memories. Level one, we keep the hands down and we're lifting the head, neck and shoulders up and releasing down. Level two, you're lifting your hands up and turning the head. Level three, we are legs up and hands up as we turn the head. So level one, you've probably done enough rotations of the head to be able to stop where you are. And when you're done, just roll onto your side and tuck yourself up again. It's quite a small movement, this one, but we can't underestimate its power. It's very, it's very difficult. So again, as Susie said, you don't need to do too many of these to really feel it. So just check in with yourself, see how you're feeling. Don't push it. I want to make sure we're not completely draining that battery. Good. Okay. So last couple of these ones, if you're still working, let's make these the last ones. We are going to come up into um, a position on our hands and knees, so all fours. And by request today, we are going with hip swim. So this one is a great one for the glutes, all the leg muscles. It's working the arms because we're keeping it stable, we're working the core here as well. And you see Susie is just lifting her knee, bringing it round in a circular motion to the elbow and back to that starting position. Make sure you do rest the knee down in between these reps. Don't just keep it going. So I've done three on one side already. I'm that's probably one too many for level one. So I'm just going to do my other side. Don't forget, for me, the most tiring part of this exercise is the arms because I'm weight bearing. So if you're thinking, oh, my arms aren't enjoying this, stop earlier than you had intended to. Great. When you've done your reps, guys, then just come down into child's pose. Okay. I think we'll do one more today, which is going to be opposition stretch. So again, we are going to be in that all fours position. If your arms are really tired, you don't have to do this one if you don't want to. OK, so up to you. You can just rest for this last one. We're going to come up into all four positions, so hands and knees. And we're just going to take the right arm out in front as the left leg goes back, as Susie's doing right now. And you may just want to do a couple of these. You might just want to do one each side. If you're level one, that might be enough. 
If you're level two, level three, remember you can introduce that little half press up if you wish. I really like this. Hmm. I think because you're also sort of stretching the body a bit as well yeah. as strengthening it. Anything to do with stretching is good in my books. <laughs> Okay, when you've done as many reps as feels right for you, come down into child's pose or whatever position feels right. That's gonna be our last one for today before we do our yoga element. So just rest. <clears throat> and then we're gonna get ready for yoga. So you may wanna take your shoes off if you're wearing them. Maybe have your blanket near you or something warm and a belt if you have one. Any kind of belt is fine. Dressing gown belt, trouser belt, just a pair of pajama bottoms if you need one. But if you're already ready to just lie down and go into relaxation, then be there and we will catch up with you. You can just breathe with us, okay? We are gonna do a little bit of work sitting up. So that comment that I made, I was kind of embedding, oh, stretching is good. <laughs> my subliminal advertising for a little bit of stretching of the backs of our bodies. So I'm gonna start sitting. So I've got a yoga block, right? Which is essentially like sitting on a small cushion just to kind of elevate the sit bones, elevate my bottom, which means my back doesn't have to work as hard. So sit on something. We are gonna have a belt to hand and we are going to put a cushion underneath the straight leg. So I'll show you which one is the straight one to start with, okay? So guys, remember it's really important if you're thinking, actually I'm ready to just lie down, lie down. We're just gonna do a couple of things here and then we're gonna join you on the mat anyway. I've got both legs straight to start with, but I'm just gonna put a cushion, a small cushion underneath my left knee. And that's gonna stop that leg from overstretching, which is important, okay? When we are not as active, everything gets a little bit softer and it's really easy to create an injury. So let's not do that. I'm gonna roll out this right leg and bring the foot up the inside of the leg. So if you're someone that has any knee or hip injuries or issues, then supporting that with another cushion. You have to have lots of cushions to work safely in restorative yoga. So if you need the support, use it. If you don't need it, this feels fine, great. I have got my belt and I'm going to place the belt just there around the end of my foot and make sure the bits are reachable. Okay. <laughs> Jane Ahmed, I've got this brilliant foot of yours right in front of the camera lens there. <laughs> Your sock, I just want you to draw a little face on it. That would make me laugh. Okay. I'm going to take my arms and stretch up. First of all, just breathe in. And then breathe out and reach forward and catch the belt and then lift up again. So I'm actually working to straighten through my spine. The heel is down on the floor. So let's get those heels back down if you pulled it up. And I'm really, you'll see my arms and the belt quite soft. I'm just doing a little bit of a pull. I've also got straight arms. If you're working like this, you're gonna put tension in the shoulder joint. If you're working with the arms long, then the actual arm itself can take, to be, the arm sort of becomes part of the belt. Think of that. I'm gonna breathe in and lift my chin up a little bit. And then breathe out and walk those hands forwards just as far as you can go, but before it becomes too much. That's a really important part of my uh, instruction here, guys. It might be that it's easier for you now to put your hands on the floor. If you can catch the foot, catch the foot, but make sure you're not overdoing anything, okay? This isn't about you working on getting the longest hamstrings you've ever had. This is about you releasing tension from your back. Now, relax the jaw and let's breathe. Let the head come down slowly if you haven't already. Let the eyes close. 
If it's too deep where you're working, you won't be able to be re uh, to relax in it. So come back up the leg a little bit. It's absolutely fine to have your hands on the floor, remember. If it's too strong a stretch, the body will distract you from it. Okay, gently breathing in, come on back up. I'm going to bring my foot off the bent leg. Just stand it in front of me for a moment. And I'm sliding that cushion out from under my knee because we're going to take a twist. So this foot will step over my straight leg. All right. I'm going to put both hands on that front knee and just lift my spine up long. Shoulders down. And I'm hooking my opposite arm around that bent knee. So this is my left arm going around that right knee. Yeah? Good. I'm going to take my other arm and breathe in as I lift it up. And breathe out as I drop it down behind me. Fingertips touch the floor. Now get the chin up off the chest. Relax the forehead. Relax the jaw. Relax the tongue in the mouth. And just allow the breath to move slowly in and slowly out. Jam, turn towards me. So folks, there's a couple of you just going the wrong way. So you've got your right leg on top, but you should be turning towards that bent leg, turning towards the thigh. Yes, there we go. Brilliant. Jaw soft. Tongue soft. Breathing in. Katie, your cats just came in. <laughs> nice. Hi, they're saying. Let's release and come back to center all the way. Okay. I'm going to go straight to the second side. So we're going to use a cushion for support underneath the straight leg to stop it from overstretching. Turn out the other leg, bring the foot up. If that foot or the leg needs some support, support it. So this position is called Janu Shishasana, which means um, head, knee to head, head to knee pose. But I don't want you to think about that. I want us just to think about taking the body forward, not about trying to get your head to your leg at all. That's not a goal here, all right? I'm going to take the belt, put it around the foot. And this just allows us to sort of do a bit of a gentle stretch without even going forwards. Gosh, it suddenly started to pour down with rain here on my skylights. <laughs> Shoulders down, lift those ribs up. Now I'm gonna walk down the belt a little bit, stop, lift up again. Breathe in. Breathe out now, hands to the floor, to the foot, stay on the belt, whatever feels good, but it has to be softening. Jaw relaxed, tongue soft. And remember, if it feels too much like a stretch, just come back out a little bit. We're inviting the body just to ease out, using the breath, creating a bit of space. And slowly lifting the head, gently coming back up. I'm going to move the cushion from under my straight leg and take the foot of the bent leg and step it over. Hands to the front knee, shoulders down. That's it. So this stretch up, this lift up here is an important part of the work. So I want you to try and get right up on the sit bones in your bum. Then I'm hooking the opposite arm around the bent leg. So now it's my right arm going along the front of the knee of that left leg. And I'm gonna be turning towards the top leg. The other arm, the free arm lifts, inhale, exhale, turn now towards that back shoulder. Get the breath down into the abdomen. Jaw soft, tongue soft. Forehead soft. We can put all sorts of tension into the face and neck here. Just check for that. 
Lift the chin up off the chest if you've dropped the gaze down. That's it. Good. Let's take a breath in and release gently back to center. Okay. I've got both my legs bent. Okay, I've got the heels on the mat, but my knees are right up in the air. I'm just gonna lean forwards and take what's called Pashimottanasana, means full forward extension. Normally done with straight legs, but I want us to really bend the legs to allow the pelvis to tilt, which means the back can move forwards without you putting any strain through your spine. So just take a little moment here, breathing in once again to the back of the body. And then slowly lift the head and come back up. Okay, we're gonna come down onto our mats now. I will do one more thing with the belt and it will be stretching the legs up one at a time. Really good for our circulation. So I try and put this in as often as I can. If you want something under your head now, put something under your head, that's fine. So from a lying down position, I've got my legs bent. I'm gonna take the belt and put it around the ball of my right foot and stretch that leg up in the air. And just take a little wiggle of your toes, open out the back of the knee. The other leg is bent, so there's no tension through the lower back. Inhale and exhale. Let's release that leg down. Just straighten it out for a moment, all the way flat down. The other one can stay as it is. Slow down the breath. Okay, I'm going to bend the right leg, bring it next to the left for a moment. And then let's take the belt, put it around the ball of the left foot and stretch that leg up in the air. Just to wherever feels good and for however long feels good. Breathing slowly in, slowly out. Remember the more calm and slow you can get your transitions, the more we're constantly giving the signal to the brain, I'm safe, it's okay. We're not in panic mode or in calm mode, which means we can begin to rest and repair. Inhale and exhale, gently let that leg go. And we'll let them both slide down to straight now. Just take a moment, allowing the circulation just to settle back in. Good. All right. One more thing before we move into our relaxation. Something for our shoulders. I've got my belt in my hands, but I'm holding it approximately shoulder width apart. And I've also bent my legs again. So we're gonna need a bit of clearance above the head. I'm just pushing my cushion out the way. So if you're on your bed, you might wanna just wriggle down a little bit. We're gonna breathe in as we take the arms back above the head. And breathe out as you bring it back down. Okay, let's do that one or two more times, up to you. If you've done one and you're thinking that's enough, you can stop. If you're coming again, breathe in. And breathe out all the way back. And let's do one more, breathing in. And breathing out. OK, 
okay. Again, just let the arms rest by the sides of the body, straighten those legs down, take a moment. Now, I want you to get ready for Shavasana, for your relaxation. So some of you might already be there. Others may want to put something under the backs of the knees to allow the abdomen to soften a bit. You might be cold or experiencing chills, in which case you might want to put a cover or a blanket over you, whatever's, whatever's going to work for you. If you want a cushion under your head, support the head. If you've got your glasses on, is it, is it okay to relax with them on or are you okay to take them off? Whatever's going to really give your body and your brain the signals that you're letting go for a few minutes. Good. So first and foremost, just allow a stillness. I want you to take your awareness all the way down to your feet for a moment and just feel the feet. Can you feel the big toe? Can you feel the heel, the instep? Just all of your thoughts and awareness moving down there. Is there any sensation on the top of the foot? The sole of the foot? Can you feel the pulse anywhere around the foot or toes? Let's take our awareness now to our hands. What can you feel when you think into the hand area? Do you feel the pulse? Do you feel a temperature? It's a little easier to connect in with the hands than the feet. They have more senses in them, more nerve endings. Is there a temperature difference between the top of the hand and the underside of the hand? Now bring your awareness to the muscles in your face. We have 23 sets of expression muscles, constantly reflecting our conscious and sometimes our less conscious thoughts. Just give them permission now to step back from duty. So scan through all of the area of the face, around the mouth, the cheeks, the sides of the eyes, between the eyes, the forehead, above the eyebrows. around the chin and the jawline. Check the jaw itself is relaxed. And now take your attention to how you're breathing. Gently, softly lengthening that inhale. Gently, softly lengthening the exhale. Ideally, keeping the breath moving through the nose. But if that's difficult for you today, just breathe however works for you. Every time you exhale, imagine you're letting go and breathing out a layer of tension. And we hold multiple layers, 
most of which we're not aware of. But we're giving them permission to just lift themselves from us and be breathed away. And every time that happens, the body sinks a little deeper, surrenders a little more down into a state of deep rest. The mind slows down, adrenaline levels drop, cortisol levels drop. And that shift from fight flight into rest repair can happen. You're facilitating that consciously by creating this wonderfully deep rest state in mind and body. And as you enter into this deep state of rest, I want you to imagine you're breathing in a sense of peace and calm. And allowing that peace and calm to move through you. Now, if you're wanting to stay here and not join in the group discussion, I'm going to invite you to switch off or log off from class now so that you can continue here. If you want to stay for the chat, we're going to be looking at mental health and fatigue today. Those are my kind of starter topics. We can cover anything else that someone wants to bring to the table too. So if you're moving up and out, let's take a slow, gentle breath in. Slowly bend those legs. And let's roll completely over onto one side. And just stay on your side for a moment. And then slowly push yourself to a sitting upright position. Bring those hands in by heart center. Just take a moment to notice how you are now. And let's bring those hands up to the forehead for right thought, to the mouth for right word, and back to the heart for right action. Namaste. Okay. So, you guys know if you're sticking around, we continue to record this because this will be something that other people will watch later. It's always incredibly useful. Um, so I have sort of said, because I think it's really appropriate 
especially because it's Mental Health Awareness Week here in the UK. I think mental health is a biggie for, I think, this journey, this recovery. Um, so we'll definitely do a little bit of discussion around that. Um, and then I know that some people had talked about wanting to just get some tips and thoughts from people. Jo Coulon, au revoir, madame. A bientôt, see you next week. <laughs> um, some tips around fatigue and, you know, obviously with the wonderful range of people that are in class now, we've got some people who've been managing fatigue for quite a long time and have got some tips and wisdom to share with others who are newer to the game. Oh, we've got someone in the waiting room, let's see. They're called Zoom user. <laughs> um, so I'm gonna unspotlight me, uh, but I think I will probably start, I think I've just yeah, I've spotlighted you now for some reason. I don't know if I have, Ross. <laughs> um, I think most of us know that um, mental health and mental ill health will be a part of this uh, illness and this recovery. Um, and it can be quite surprising at times. So I remember it from my own from my own memory, you know, when I when I was in the most acute stage of it last year, I would just cry all of a sudden out of nowhere. I would just have these deep little spikes of despair. And I could be in the middle of doing something like cooking dinner and be fine. And then suddenly I would not be fine and I'd have to stop what I was doing and sob. Uh, and it was an extraordinary sort of thing that I began to notice. So there's a pattern to this. Um, and what's interesting, I think, is that, you know, a lot of people, when they first start to experience these kinds of things, maybe for the first time, or maybe, maybe you've had other mental ill health moments or episodes in your life before, they can be quite shocking and quite scary and quite intimidating. And we don't really know how to manage it. And the people around us don't really know how to manage it. Um, but beginning to recognize that it's a part of what's happening to us psychologically, because don't forget we're a system, right? It's all connected up, the brain, the body, the body, the brain, it's all part of the same system. So it doesn't surprise me that this is part of the recovery story as well. Um, and for me, I know that, you know, when I'm beginning to slip downhill again and I'm beginning to get more symptoms, I will notice it in my mental health as well. And you know, I've been making a post every week into our main Facebook group around mental health awareness. And I think I flagged up at some point, you know, I'm having a really kind of low time and I notice, I notice my symptoms uh, physically and mentally. So not only have I got icy chills going on at the moment and the tremor has come back, um, a little bit of brain fog, but also, a, you know, a real resistance to do mm. some of my standard timetable teaching. I had someone else teach my general class for me this morning. But mentally, I feel like I just want to cry a lot. And um, for me, it's, it's about noticing oh, this is part of that and not, not worrying about it too much and actually, you know, talking to anyone that will sort of listen <laughs> about it and trying to normalize it. I think it's really important. Um, and, you know, one of the things that I, I often talk to people about when I talk about mental health is knowing what your signs are, what happens for you when you notice you're beginning to slide down. Because if you can notice those signs early and you notice patterns in yourself, um, there are things that you can do about it. Um, so, you know, I know for me, moving, getting out of my head and into my body can help. Um, going outside always helps. So, you know, if I've got the energy, walk the dog. Um, talk to someone, tell someone, you know, yesterday, I think I cried when I had a chat with Ross, we were chatting before class, and I just had a cry and I felt a bit better for it. And it was just, you know, someone else kind of was with me for a moment in that and it was just great. So I just want to invite anyone else, you know, I've just kind of done a big blah, 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 here's me. Does anyone else have a, a sort of a similar thing or does anyone else have a story that's, that, that they wanna share? Ros Beard, I see your hand straight up there. Hello, we've not seen you for a little while. <laughs> Welcome back into class. Joe House, are you waving or do you wanna talk? You're having a wave. No. <laughs> waving at Ros, good, okay. Rosie, share your story. What would you like to say? Yeah, I am. Um... Well, I remember if you thought. Um, morning. 
Hi. You. I was hoping you do a mental health thing today. I've just been really thinking that I'm just desperate to talk about this actually. Can jump in straight in. Um, I feel this stage, I mean I'm I'm one of the people who got ill March twenty twenty, so it's been a hell of a long time. And um for probably the first six to eight months, I was absolutely convinced that I was just focusing on my physical health and I was just so desperate to get back to running, to get back to work, that I, I just kept doing deals with myself. It's like if I have if I have no alcohol at all for two months, I'll be able to run for five minutes. And I kept thinking that this was what it was all about. And I was so focused on, you know, I, I used to cry when I saw other people out running. You know, I just loved running. And <laughs> the thought of never being able to do it again was breaking my heart. Um, but it wasn't until I did the mindfulness class that I actually finally understood how bad my mental health was and how much I needed to pay attention to that. Um, so that was in March this year, I did the Oxford Mindfulness class. And um, at first, I mean, for the first few weeks, so in WG, you might remember me crying all the time. I don't know if there's anybody else there from that class as well. But um, I just, it was, um, it became apparent to me that I had so many techniques to avoid paying attention to myself. And the things I did, I thought were me resting. Um, so I was doing Sudoku's, I was reading, I was watching television, um, talking to friends, um, anything except pay attention to myself, really. And once I realized how low I was, um, and I, I, yeah, I'd cry and cry and cry, I got to the point where I decided I really wasn't managing. Um, despite everything that's around with these classes and the mindfulness and my family and so on, I decided to start taking um, medication. And, um, you know, all of us, we're all, we're all yoga people, you know, we do, we do mindfulness, we do yoga. We, I mean, I would say I've never really thought about taking medication before in my life. But the antidepressants I've been taking have been phenomenally helpful. Um, they've given me a really sort of gentle cushion um, and now instead of crying every day I probably cry maybe once a week and um, I feel as though I've learned to accept where I'm at physically so I don't feel I'm fighting myself anymore um, but the last hurdle of the mental health and I would love some ideas about what to do is I'm actually terrified by my loss of cognitive facilities um, and memory. Um, I got a real massive shock this week so I forgot a really important appointment. But I didn't just forget to get it. I talked to my daughter at lunchtime and said I've, I'm really looking forward to my appointment with Tanya at two o'clock. And somehow at two o'clock I was just sitting reading a book, having my lunch, and Tanya phoned and just said, Are you all right, Rose? You haven't turned up your appointment. And in that hour between talking my, to my daughter and actually getting ready to go, it has completely left my head. And that, for me, I mean, that is the most terrifying thing, just this losing memory, losing thoughts. Mm. That's my story at the moment. Thank you. Roz, thank you for sharing that. Gosh. And I really, I really get what you say when, you know, I, I loved what you said around you know, we're yoga people, we're mindfulness, you know, we, we know how to look after ourselves. But I think that, you know, that's not the catch all, is it? And it can be something that feels like a sort of a failure going and getting help via the medical route. But so many people, you know, this, this condition changes us, you know, and challenges us in ways that we've never known. And if you need to go down the medical route, and you get help from that, then that is fantastic and I first of all love to hear you say that that's been something that's made a difference to you and that you got to the point of knowing that that was where you needed to go and and you're not the only one and I know lots of people that it's really helped I'm an advocate of doing whatever you can for your mental health and there's a massive spectrum of things out there so great and I think you know what you've just said around the fact that you've lost 
you know, the cognitive ability, I'm sure there's a, I'm seeing a lot of nodding faces out there going, yeah, I'm, I'm struggling with that. Joe House, you've got your hand raised and I don't know if it's on this. But yeah, great. Okay, come on. Yeah, I just wanted, similar, Ros and I have seen each other class for a long time because we both march first waivers. Um, um, and similarly, I think I got to that point. I th think we were coping pretty well and you see Ash on here with me sometimes. We use humour a lot um, to cope well and we've, you know, been in it together, which helps. The kids have been great. But I think I got to a point in February when I was having a crash, similar to you said, Susie, and the mental symptoms come along with all the physical symptoms. And then the fact that you're feeling worse also adds on extra layers of um, poor mental health. Um, and I, I kind of got through to February thinking we were coping really well, then realised I wasn't, work was putting me under pressure and I was just in tears all the time. And so I took antidepressants and they were ones that I'd actually taken years ago when my youngest son had been in hospital a lot and I was pregnant again and um, but you know he'd been in and out of hospital since baby and then I didn't want to take antidepressants I was having a breakdown kind of of the fallout of that and I was pregnant again and thought I couldn't cope with an ill child and a baby and I really didn't want to take antidepressants because I had a baby growing in me and then um, my dad who's a pharmacist sat me down and just sort of talked through it and said when you're really stressed all the time or really ill all the time or anything like that's going on you're just producing so much cortisol that your body's out of sync and what the antidepressants are doing they're just resetting your body so I wasn't doing anything to you know by taking chemicals to make you know my body worse for the baby it was actually kind of resetting it back to a more normal situation for and I, I found that that was more helpful than anything any other medics or anyone told me where well, he is a sort of medic but I, I you know I thought that was really useful it's just that realizing that your body is in a sort of circle cycle where it's out of sync and if that just helps you get back in sync and then helps you just be able to cope with what for all of us you know lots of us have been very scared we've been very ill lots of us are coping now with thinking about ourselves as being um uh, short term or disabled or longer term it's really hard to plan anything we're not able to care in the way we used to or do our jobs there's quite a loss of sense of value and self-worth in all of that so there's sort of multiple ways I think we're all struggling and, and and just like Susie said anything that we can do that gives us a little bit of help while we sort things through um, and, and, and get through this is, is really good. And yeah, I think sort of humor has been one of the mm. <laughs> one of good things for me. Mm. Absolutely. Jo, thanks for sharing that. Um, I just want to, Rachel, I'll come to you in a second. And Tina, I see you have your hand up as well. I just want to come back to the point that, um, and Rachel, maybe this is what you want to pick up on, that that kind of cognitive uh, loss, you know, is there anything that anyone is, is trying or doing that's making a difference to that. Because often I'm seeing, you know, the, because I think, Roz, you did try with niacin. Didn't you try all of that sort of stuff? Did you play around with that? Yeah. So I know that a lot of people are saying, oh, you know, taking the stack has helped them with their cognitive ability and various bits and pieces like that. But if, you, if you've already been experimenting there and that's not shifting, then that's obviously not the right solution for you. Um, Rachel, was there something that you wanted to add into this one? Yeah, a couple of things. Um, first of all, I, I did put on the Facebook page that I had my first NHS counselling session yesterday yeah. through the IAPT self-referral system. Um, and I know somebody put on there, they do it all by text. That's how they start. And you only get referred after if the texting system doesn't work for you. But that isn't what actually happened. Can I they just do ask, do you mean you get the session by text? you get some counseling by text there is there is so there is a weird there's this company um which a friend of mine was involved in as a director on it actually that are aiming to move towards ai counseling let's not even go there okay, okay? And, and they are involved in this self-referral system in that you can self-refer on a computer system, but then you have a live human have an assessment with you. So I had a lovely lady phone me up and she spent an hour and a half on the phone with me, assessing me. And then at the end of that session, she gave me the options. 
that were available and asked me which I thought would be most helpful for me. And I said, definitely one-to-one counselling. So they're giving me one-to-one intensive CBT. No idea what the intensive therapy bit of it means. (laughs) I'll let you know. Um, Just seemed like normal counselling to me, but there we go. Anyway, so yesterday I had my first session and actually it's only been eight weeks from self-referral to first session, which for NHS is amazing. So I really, you know, for anyone who can't afford private counselling or doesn't want to go that way, I've just chosen not to go that way. Um, I'd really recommend self-referral because you haven't got anything to lose. And it was so useful. And we've talked specifically about things that we're going to work, you know, what I want to get out of it. Um, which is to process the trauma of being ill and not being able to access any help and support um, and the fear of that and that goes all that everybody knows about. So I'll leave that there. Um, And um, she talked about the fact that she feels from what I say, I've had a loss of my identity and it just all slotted into place because I was explaining about the fact that I've always relied on my brain and, um, that I got, you know, the, the neurological damage to my brain that I had, um, which I'm working my way through and is getting better and the brain fog is getting better from having seen a clinical psychologist, but to, uh, you know, that loss of that, my, my intelligence is part, a big part of my identity, rightly or wrongly. Um, the loss of my identity with the sport that I do across a range of sports to a high level that I can't do anymore. The fact that I'm normally the one that's caring for everybody else. And I do lots of volunteer work, which I can't do anymore. So I'd lost, she's talking about that loss of identity. And I think that's a theme that runs through for everybody, different, different identities for different people. But I think that's the theme. And if she can help me sort of come to terms with that and find ways of getting some because she talked about the ways of getting some of my identity back within what I'm going through so I just yeah just to recommend that service because I think it looks like it's going to be really good and the other thing is in relation to brain fog um, obviously I was doing my PhD application and that became really well it wasn't possible and then with the support that I've had, it has been possible. And I have put that application in and I have been offered a place. So um, things that helped. I actually was taking coenzyme Q10 at the time that I did my application. And because it wasn't in the stack and I ran out, I stopped taking it. And I've just got some more and I restarted again yesterday because I had noticed that my brain fog had got worse again. And I know for chronic fatigue syndrome, they recommend coenzyme Q10 for brain fog, which is why I took it in the first place. But then because it wasn't in the MCAS stack and I ran out, I dropped it. So might be worth trying for people with brain fog because it definitely made a difference to me. Um, And um, then brain training, training my brain in the way the clinical psychologist told me to do it would be the other thing. And I did put that all on the site at the time. I photographed all the pages and put it on the site. But that's rebuilding all the synapses, um, spending time with other people, getting out in the real world as much as you can within the bounds of your illness and connecting with everything outside as much as you can. Um, yeah, just anything, jigsaw puzzles, um, any kind of puzzle that you're interested in, um, lots of things like that. Avoiding the news, I was told that. So I don't, and social media. So the only social media I do is our um, Facebook page. I don't do anything else anymore. Um, yeah. So that, if anyone's interested, the list of that is somewhere on the Facebook page. But that has really helped, and I systematically did what she suggested, and it has made a huge difference. I'm not about to say that my brain is back to normal. It is not, but it's a lot better than it was. If I was anywhere near the point where I could apply for a PhD, Rachel, I'd be feeling pretty chuffed with myself right now. So, <laughs> so you've sat, you sound like you've worked kind of really methodically on that, which I, you know, which I admire hugely. Well done. That's uh, that's that's absolute focus and commitment for you 
Uh, oh, Syrah, your comment just popped up and then it's disappeared me, for me again. What did that say there? We can have neurological inflammation as well as different to body inflammation, which can lead to brain fog and cognitive issues. I've been prescribed specific supplements for this, which is helping along with pacing to reduce fatigue, which reduces brain fog. Yeah, it's all linked. Remember, these, don't, these things don't happen in separation. They happen together as part of a systemic response in the body. So there isn't just one thing that we can do for one thing. There's, you know, we have to do think about ourselves fully. Anna Porter, Dr. Anna Porter, <laughs> which supplements, Syra? Maybe you could just type them into the list, love. Then we've got a little uh, written checklist of what's up there. That would be great. Um, great story sharing. Yeah, I would say that I've I got into. I mean, I trained partly as a counselor, and I'm also an NLP coach. Um, and so for me, talking about my mental health has, has always been something that I've done and been interested in, been an advocate for. And as soon as I knew that this thing was going on in my body, and you know, and I've been ill for around 12 weeks last year. I got into counseling with my own counselor again and I'm still there, you know, God, thank God. Um, and it helps me massively because I have someone that's not connected with the story other than with me and my experience of it, which just makes it a really, really great and safe space to kind of share what's happening and what's going on. And he can track the highs and lows for me. So he will be the one that will say, oh, you know, a few weeks ago, you started to talk about this and I'm seeing that that's becoming more of a thing, you know, and I might not even be aware of it. It really helps. Um, anyone else? So Teen, you did have your hand raised and your hand is still raised. And Kathy, I see your hand is raised too. Teen, would you like to unmute yourself? Yeah, there, thank Hi. you. Uh, I, I, in terms of brain fog, I, I don't actually really know if it is good or not, but I took collagen for a while. Oh. Uh, every day and I actually felt and then I didn't because you know it's expensive it's expensive <laughs> <laughs> so I didn't and I actually felt like I was really missing that in my daily little hot chocolate and sit and have my hot chocolate with my colleague and I felt like it helped mm -hmm. yeah it, so anyway just just to try it out I, I can't really say you know that's interesting that you mentioned that because when I started to lose all of my hair last year around kind of month four I started taking collagen um, and, a, and a different multi bit, and I've taken that every day since. Um, mm -hmm. And my brain fog has only at times tripped me up. Uh, it's definitely not something that um, I I worry about particularly. So maybe it has helped. It's difficult to know, right? Because I can't do a blind test. But um, my hair definitely has recovered. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's true. And then, um... <laughs> helped thanks thanks for sharing that um it's also very good for um for you know perimenopause and menopausal women because as you've got all the kind of deterioration and changes happening in the body collagen helps to kind of support that so you know can i mention another thing which is more in terms of mental health well yeah. it, it's actually more sort of like if anybody i would just like to hear other people share i realized yesterday because i'd posted something on facebook about long covid due to a survey in Denmark and da -da. so I was sharing a bit more than I normally do about where I'm at and I received a message from a friend saying oh I think you're holding yourself in an image of illness I think you need to of course you can travel to Denmark this summer and I think you need to see a, a therapist or a psychologist right away and you need you know she had like and we haven't talked for years basically and and that's one thing and it's triggering and you can work with that. But I realized out of that, that part of how I experienced myself, but I was suddenly like, wow, I do actually have in the back of my mind how others experience me. And it's just sort of like, and I don't know if anybody else is, it's just a new, like, I feel people are mostly supportive. And then sometimes I get these, but suddenly I was like, wow, she was quite triggered by my post, but it's also like, how do they, view me now like I am very very different and I've been very I live alone with kids I've been very much alone and I still don't really go for walks and stuff and so I feel like I've managed quite well and I do get support and but that feeling like it's just something new for me to sort of go wow and of course I need to come back to myself and focus on you know it's from the inside out and all of that so I, I will do that but I just suddenly realized 
wow it's just the way that people also view me like it has also changed and that was just a new thing and I don't know if it makes sense to anybody else but it's just it kind of just pulled the rug and I I was better a week ago and then I've just had quite a relapse this week so on top of that and then going okay I need to go back from a month ago what did I do a month ago I'm gonna go and do that again and then I'm gonna build up again but it's just yeah anyway I'm rambling I just I just for me that was just a huge thing so me go like oh yeah Thank you. <laughs> I'm just I'm just not myself in that sense. I totally, totally hear what you're saying and can, and I'm sure everyone in this conversation right now will understand that when you read that comment, you felt, as you described, the rug pulled out from underneath you, like, hang on a minute. Whoa, that, you know, that kind of paradigm shift in your head of, whoa, someone is looking at me and thinking that I'm making my problem for me. And isn't that what the ME and the CFS community have been saying for years, right? They've been going, guys, we're not making this up. <laughs> we are not choosing this. This is not a lifestyle choice I've made for myself. Um, so I totally get that. Does anyone else have anything that, that they can kind of relate to that? Has anyone else experienced? Because what I do know when I did that workshop a while ago around, you know, 12 months and beyond quite a lot of people said that they'd lost friendships you know people that they had relied on or a bit of thought had been close and understanding they'd suddenly gone okay enough now you know and their friendships had changed completely and that had been quite a devastating loss um Kathy you've got your hand up and I see you nodding and kind of waving your head so I think I'm going to I'm going to come to you now I was just going to say before I forget this because I've also got brain fog. Um, lion's mane supplement is also supposed to be good. What's it called? Can you write it into the chat box because we're kind of collecting supplements names there. <laughs> it's, it's called Lion's Mane. Um, I actually haven't taken it because I've not had much brain fog, but I've heard from other people that have got long COVID that it's been brilliant. So, um, but I'll write it in the comments. That would be brilliant. Lion's Mane. Okay. Just the thing, it was quite interesting listen, listening to Teen say that. It was just actually quite triggering for me because I just thought, how upsetting for somebody mm. to send you that message. Mm. Um, when obviously we're all doing our best and, and trying to be well because that's what we want. Um, but one thing that I have had some success with, um, which links to your NLP stuff, Susie, um, I'm a coach as well, so I kind of went into this thinking, oh, well, I'll know how to coach myself better, but no. Um, <laughs> and I really, I've, done a lot, I've done a lot of work on my kind of mental health, but actually, and I don't, I don't tend to kind of ignore the signs, I tend to listen to them. Um, however, what I was doing is living in a state of kind of perpetual fear that I was creating for myself. So I was very scared for a long time of making myself ill, more ill, or, or, or bringing on a relapse and all those kind of things. Um, and I did, I know I mentioned to you before I did the DNRS course, which I am going to do a post on because I think it'll be useful for people. Um, but I did that course and part of that was around kind of using some NLP techniques of visualizing yourself in, in the past, in, in times where things were really good and things were happy you were doing whatever you do then you felt you know your best self um and i've been doing quite a lot of work around that so kind of re-engaging with me who because it's still me that's what i've realized um and then doing some kind of visualizations into the future to see myself in situations that now might feel quite scary to me um and it's worked it's helped me really quite a lot to to kind of um, placate the, the anxiety and fear about going back to things because for me that was a big thing like can I can I go for a walk with a friend or will I relapse you know this kind of stuff and actually I've been able to do it and enjoyed it and yeah sometimes there's been a few symptoms after but I've kind of that's fine now I've, I've accepted it. Mm. Well, I love that you mentioned that exercise because we do we do sometimes do that as the as the relaxation guided meditation, you know, reminding the body of a time when you've been well. And just it's almost like you have to trigger that little response that it's OK. We, we've got that in us. We've got that ability in us still. It's 
just about kind of fine tuning and allowing it to, to be given a little bit more space again, um, because we can become incredibly focused on the illness, the symptoms, the experience, the worry, the managing of it, because sometimes, you know, especially when we're having a really low day, we can feel like it's just such a full time job, just getting through your day and, you know, not causing a relapse or, or managing a relapse and getting through your day with one. Um, that it's, it can become just that the brain can just only think about the, the difficult stuff. So reminding ourselves, I think is really good for us as a system, you know, just, it's all in there. It's about kind of just sort of shining some lights back into the happy moments again, isn't it? And going, hey, come on, remember that time. <laughs> all those endorphins from the happy stuff that's happened in your life, it kind of brought back to me I was doing loads of visualizations about when I went traveling and did all, did all this stuff. And, and I thought, yeah, I'm still that person. Like it's not gone. Mm. It's almost like, I don't want, you know, that will come back. And now I've kind of accepted that I'm, I'm where I am now, but I know that that's all in me and I can tap into it whenever I want to. And it's really helpful. Lovely. Oh, that's really lovely to hear Kathy. Great. Thank you for sharing that. We've got lots of hands up. I think this is proving to be a very <laughs> meaty discussion, which doesn't surprise me. Um, I have no way of knowing that how long someone has, been, if someone has got a really achy arm, that means you've had your hand up for a while. Katie Quinn, I could see that you were down there with your hand patiently for the whole of Kathy. So let me come to you next. Yeah, I just, um, quite a few things have resonated when people have been speaking. Um, I was doing the mindfulness course with Roz when she did it and I felt really on track then I was able to practice the mindfulness and take it all in and it was really helping and I felt like that that whole wiggly curve that we have with long COVID was quite nicely ironed out and I was improving slowly and then um when I got a UTI recently and got ambulance to hospital and then other stuff has been happening with my family, my 11 year old's being really difficult and my aunt just died. So I'm feeling quite emotional today. This is kind of a perfect discussion because I attended her funeral at 2 a.m. Uh, in the morning this morning because it was in New Zealand. My niece is in hospital and just dealing with all those things. Um, I now feel uh, kind of in the position that Rose talked about feeling before she took antidepressants but then because we have these highs and lows it's it's hard to know sometimes you know is it just a wee low that you're gonna come through and you just have to I know not not push ourselves but at the same time a couple of weeks ago I think you said to me about just showing up at yoga um, and I think the last couple of classes I haven't felt like showing up I didn't want to um so I think there's that element of kind of pushing yourself at the same time listening but I know I know yoga and breathing and meditation will help me but I know at the moment I'm really resistant I just I feel like I don't want to do those things so I guess it's a sign that you know maybe if it doesn't change and I get like you said about your counsellor, um, kind of watching the highs and lows. I've got my partner to to watch and I talked to him a lot about mental health in the early days and said, you know, please, can you keep an eye on me? And if if you think I'm deteriorating or need antidepressants, then um, let me know. And I think that's I think it's really important that we do involve someone else in helping us just keep an eye on on that. But ultimately at the moment um I, I i don't remember people's names but um it was about the kind of fear and the anxiety in spite of mental health being um so widely uh talked about and we you know we've tried to take away the taboos around it i feel a massive taboo around it especially with long covid because um, I've got a second absence review coming up soon at work and they always ask me about if I'm on medication um, and I think I don't want my physical illness to be put down to anxiety or stress or depression 
So I feel a real sense of taboo and fear and anxiety about it. And and I'm not, my sister committed suicide um, when I was 20. So I've dealt with the taboos around mental health for a long time. I'm able to talk about those things with other people. And yet when it's myself and when it comes to work-related issues and this kind of, um, there's this, this fraud feeling, isn't there, around sort of ME, chronic fatigue, long COVID, um, is it a real illness? And I, I'm, I'm, you know, it is a real illness and we all feel these symptoms, but there are still people out there who will challenge, um, challenge those, like um, the lady's friend who said about going on holiday. So I just wondered, um, yeah, I wondered if anyone has any responses around that and how to do it. I mean, it's it's my own feelings and and I feel like, oh, hang on, you know, get over yourself. If you have to take antidepressants or work wants to know about that. But one of my fears is that work might dismiss my long COVID illness or my GP might on the basis of um, anxiety or depression, you yeah. know, getting in the middle of it. And maybe, maybe it's just short term and the other things will work out, but that that's, you know, it's a really big fear that's there at the moment. Totally hear you, totally and utterly hear you. And, you know, even if you had, you know, just your illness to focus on, which you don't, you've got so much going on now that, you know, anyone, you know, even if you're in fit, fit and health state, you know, you've attended a funeral at 2 a.m., you've got stuff going on with your family, you know, there's a lot on your plate. And I think sometimes we expect ourselves to cope right? Well, I'll be able to cope with all of that and I'll cope with that and then I'll cope with that as well. And then I'll cope with all of that on top. And actually, I think it's okay to not cope sometimes, but it's in that moment. What do you do when you go, actually, I don't know if I am coping so well with all of this. And I think that's, that's the key, you know, it's totally fine to put your hand up and say, I'm not coping, but what do you do? I think, Joe, you've had your house, your, your Joe house has had her hand raised. What would you like to say, Syra? I see you as well. Yeah, I think coming to the what you do with it. Um, I mean, so I've been a climate change scientist for years, dealing with sceptics. And now I'm a long COVID advocate and I can talk at, for the BMJ and NIHR and the rest of the And um, it's incredible the level of gaslighting we're all receiving personally. It's more, even more shocking when we're getting it from the medical community. And I was on a webinar the other day with um, Graham Burns, who runs up the Long COVID clinic in Newcastle, I think it is. I really hope no one's with that clinic. Because he said, well, I've got a cure for Long COVID. It's going to be controversial. And what it turns out it was, was we all need to get a good night's sleep and get over our anxiety. And I was, I tell you what, I was speaking after him. I had to take beta, beta blockers to get my heart rate down to be able to speak. And I was shaking, as was the medic with long COVID, who's 45 years old and very fit before, who was speaking after me. He said he was literally, we were texting each other. He's going, I'm literally in tears. So we're, we're putting out with that gaslighting, many of us from friends and family and from the medical community. Um, and when I'm dealing it, with it with the medical community I can deal with it to a certain extent with facts and figures and personal stories and I think at least we're in a position unlike the ME community where there's an overwhelming number of us that's really hard to ignore and there's tens of thousands of medical health professionals who have it as well who are a really strong voice and I think we just in, in some arenas we just have to keep having that voice and keep speaking out against it and take the opportunities to kind of go no that's not true and you need to hear and listen to patients but there's also a sense that um what we've learned dealing with climate change is when you've got really strong conspiracy theories or deniers actually don't waste your energy on them at the moment your energy is absolutely precious and you need to save as much of it as you can for healing um, and so flip it around, don't think about who are the people I've lost on the way and who are the people who aren't supporting me. Think about who are the people who've rallied around me and who are the people who are supporting me and they're the ones that are the people who are worth spending time and energy with and on. 
and you know you can try and engage a bit with people but often their minds are made up and you're it's really hard to change their minds and it takes a lot of energy and sometimes you won't so think about the you know the people who are unsure or who just don't understand that you could explain to and then they'll understand but the people who are outright gaslighting you and being you know can you can you I know it's not always possible to walk away from those important people in your life but you know just try and think about who is being supportive and helpful and spending more of your time and energy with them um, absolutely thank you Jo uh, very true and I love the fact that you know you've used your experience being gaslighted around climate change for years and you're now kind of you know I know how to manage that better <laughs> with this new topic in my life oh bless you um Guys, I feel this conversation could go on for a really long time. Is everyone okay? I'm just aware that this also is exhausting. You know, what's interesting is my, I had an acupuncture appointment booked just a few up from my house at 12 and she just sent me a message saying, can we move it to 12.30? And I'm like, yes. <laughs> so I'm really happy to just keep this going because I think it's really, really important. So um, Juliet, you have fastidiously held your hand like Hiawatha. Tell me, tell me what you would like to say. Tam, bye. <laughs> oh, hi, yeah. Um, yeah, no, I, I think what Joe said was brilliant. And um, I think with friends, um, the whole friend situation, I found quite confusing because lots of the friends who I used to see regularly and actually one I used to see every week and then um, she lives practically around the corner. She paid me one visit and never again you know and i just and then other friends who or just even people i know it's surprising because they're the ones who've been phoning all the time and saying mm -hmm. how are you i'm really worried and you know why don't you do this and and let me you know uh, it's so unpredictable and there's this kind of feeling that you know do you forgive all these people who are your friend um do you sort of you know phone them up and say, yeah, I'm a bit better now, you know, should we go for coffee, but, uh, or do you just sort of, you know, not bother with them anymore? Um, I think that's a really interesting point that you're making, Juliet, because, you know, one of the things I think that throws up for me is that I think that often in, in our society, we don't really know how to manage illness. We don't know how to manage our own illness, which means it's much more difficult for us to manage the illness that we see in other people. Um, you know, and we were sort of talking about this in our pacing conversation and, and the idea of rest and recovery. You know, we don't have a culture of rest and recovery. We have a culture of take this drug, get better quick. You know, take this drug, don't even take time off work. So actually what we've done is almost desensitized ourselves to the idea that someone that we care about might need care because we don't do that for ourselves or we're not necessarily encouraged to do that for ourselves. Um, and therefore I think, you know, and I can see people's heads nodding here. I think a lot of people, and I know a lot of people that I know, don't actually know how to reach out and offer help. They're lost. They don't have a language around it. They don't know what to say. They think, oh, well, they don't need me because they're, they'll, they'll have the people that look after them doing that. And I don't know what to say. It's a bit like when someone dies that's really close to you and you've either got the friend that knows how to talk about grief with you or those that go, I have no idea what to say. So I'm just going to wait until it's just all calmed down a little bit. And then maybe we'll go for a drink when they're feeling better. It's that. So I think it would be, you know, if we got stuck into a phase of thinking that person has rejected me or, you know, that person has let go of me as a friend during my illness, we could be in a dangerous space of losing friendships, but it might be something that, you know, if you have the ability to reach out at some point when you've got energy only and go, I'd really love to spend some time with you. And I know I'm not back to full health yet, but I'm still here mm. and it's okay. Um, you, you, get, know, you get a it, kind of feeling of abandonment, you know, and of course you do. feeling that they only want you when you're at your best of course and oh, um, absolutely. Yeah. but the the other thing i was going to say is just about um the cognitive and depression and things um um 
was about oestrogen and it's sort of well known I think with long Covid that the oestrogen level drops and with me it's all come up with my menopause and it's all at the same time um, and yet the symptoms of the menopause are so similar to so much that we're experiencing. It'd be quite interesting to see if women who are taking HRT, so I'm not, but um, if if they've been fared a bit better with the depression and the cognitive sort of impairment, and also if men with long COVID, if they're going through the same emotional sort of swings and things like that, um, I mean, I definitely have, but I don't know what's what. <laughs> um, so I don't know if anyone has found that, you know, taking oestrogen has improved things. Do you know what? I think um, I think what I'd like to do, maybe I'll put a shout out onto the big Facebook group and ask you guys as well, and anyone that's listening to this on Catch Up, if there's anyone that is medically trained, I know we've got you lovely Dr. Anna Porter there sitting here, uh, but I know we have other doctors um, and some consultants um, in the group. So it might be that we actually do a special chat on this because I think it is a women's issue and it is a conversation that we should be having. Um, and, and for us to know more about, you know, because there is, there is some research that's beginning to be done and people are beginning to make those links. But, you know, anything that we can kind of highlight um, right now would be really, really helpful because I think at the moment people are just trying things. I know that... I've started to take um, a very low dose progesterone cream on 49 at the end of next week. Um, and that is beginning to help me a little bit, but it's not changed my life. <laughs> um, so, you know, understanding, well, what, what do we know so far about the relationship with hormones and estrogen, progesterone, this long COVID uh, experience? What do we know? What can we share? What, what tips and tricks can, are worth experimenting with? Um, so I think let's do that as a special, as a special conversation. Ros Beard, you've got your hand. I can see it there going, let me say something. <laughs> Sorry. Again. Yeah. Yeah. No, I just wanted to respond to that. Just to say that I had a really, um, interesting, uh, in its hopelessness, if you like, conversation with my GP when I was feeling at my worst. Um, we were talking around all the issues, she's really good, but like many GPs, she just doesn't really know anything, she doesn't know how to help me, even though she obviously really wants to, mm -hmm. and we talked about estrogen, and we talked about depression, and we talked about all sorts of things, and she just basically said, well, you obviously need something, you need help, um, what I can offer you is either HRT or SSRIs, um, and we went through the sort of discussion about what was more likely to give me some immediate relief and what was safer. And of mm -hmm. course, blood clot issues and stuff like that. Just, um, you know, the SSRIs I'm taking have, apart from the initial side effects, they don't have any sort of long-term side effects. So we decided just to go with what looked like the safest option. So yeah. um, that's where I'm at at the moment. I'm open to anything, really. You know, I'm just sure, trying to get yeah. my hands back. Well, there's a woman in um, the Facebook group and she's had some contact with me, Professor Amelie Lukamaj. Um, and she's a consultant gynecologist at UCL, I think. Um, and I'm sure she'll have something to say because she also has long COVID. Um, so I, I know there's a few people that I might reach out to and just see if I can invite some people in to have a bit of a conversation around this particular subject. Um, now that we're beginning to kind of focus some of the conversations in this group chat a bit more, I think it's a really, really important one because we all know it's all tied up with that mental health story, right? It's part of the system. So, you know, you could be having a perfectly fine experience of this, but be having all sorts of stuff going on with your hormones and therefore your mental health will be affected by that. So, um, and you know, I'm looking at the faces here and I don't see many 21 year olds. <laughs> not saying that you guys don't look 30. I'm not saying that anyone here is above 40 because fresh as daisies guys. But I think, you know, what we know is that that 40 plus age group is definitely more at risk of this experience. Um, guys, I am going to pull the plug on this because we've, you know, we've been live now for over an hour and a half. But um, and I'm sure that we could keep this conversation going. It's really it's a really big one. So I think maybe we should put it in the diary to have a pen at some point. But thank you so much for all your contributions today. Um, it's always a pleasure. And if you're watching this on catch up and you want to question anything, then just be in touch. 
um, or post into the main Facebook group because that is an amazing resource, as you all know. Okay, I'm exhausted now. <laughs> I'm going to go to acupuncture. Guys, take care of yourselves and I will see you next time. Lots of love. Bye. <laughs>